Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for the last session of the day in the room data and business model. Now we will talk to you about something very special, which is actually the role of crowdsource mobility data. It's not something that we do a lot and that is actually why we wanted to put that into onto the stage and give it a little bit of light because we have here representatives of people who actually use information coming from the users directly from the crowd. So the, the whole idea is to try and understand what kind of information they get from their users, the feedback, and how they actually leverage the feedback of these crowdsource data within the app, within the work for quality data, and so on. But before I give them the stage, let me make sure that they are all introduced properly, and then we will start the session. So we will first have two speakers who will join us remotely. They kindly recorded video. Unfortunately, they were not able to join us in Canada for travel and COVID reason. We will first hear from Ra Franco Rapetti. He is the CTO and co-founder of Wallaby. He is based in Latin America, so Cordoba, Argentina. Uh, he has a Master of Science in Information System, and he can be reached out in Spanish, English, and Portuguese. We then have Leonardo Gutierrez, who is the Business Development Manager at Trufi. He is based in Duitama in Colombia. Uh, and Trufi is actually a non-profit uh, organization who try and help map cities in Latin America where the data doesn't exist yet. Uh, you can reach out to him in Spanish and English. Then we will have Tomo, that most of you have actually have already seen this morning. So. Again, he's the head of operations at MoveIt. He's over here, so I will let him introduce himself when he does the presentation. He will kindly explain you a little bit more about what MoveIt do with the community of Movitos that we were already introduced to a little bit this morning. And then we have Katie. She is in charge of partnership at Transit. They were the kind host of the networking apero yesterday evening, the 5 uh, said. She is based in Canada. She has a master's in public policy from the Harvard Kennedy School. And she will tell you all also about how Transit also use uh, data from the crowd. So let's start with our two speakers on video. And we will start first with Wallaby. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Everyone have heard about smart cities, but every big city has the same problem in common, that is traffic. Three years of our lives are wasted in traffic jams and 7 million people are dying every year due to global pollution, but traffic is still growing. It is almost impossible to solve mobility problems in emerging markets because there isn't any mobility data. The data, the open data portals are outdated, and if you get to find any data, for sure it won't be in a standardized format. Also, there are lots of operators to deal with, and there is a pure collaboration between them and the other sectors in the mobility ecosystem. We are here to change that. I am Franco Rapetti, CTO and co-founder of Wallaby, a big data mobility company that integrates schedules and routes of urban mobility, micro-mobility, and ride hailing operators to offer trip planning and data, and data solutions for both B2B and B2C sector. Wallaby suggests the best way to commute, considering time, cost, distances, and other issues that your trip may have, thanks to the other user reports. People can report, for instance, perceiving security at stops, so we can suggest them to skip that stop or at least be careful at night. They can report the quality and occupancy of their trips, and the most important, they provide real-time data points that feed or real-time have to provide real-time ETA to other users. Every report generated from the application goes to a moderation dashboard where ranked users can check if the information is valid and approved, starting the deployment pipeline. Wallaby was born in 2019, and we are now deployed in more than 30 cities in six countries, with more than 1 million unique users without direct marketing actions. We are convinced that mobility is key to creating sustainable and inclusive cities. In 2021, for instance, our users saved more than 30,000 tons of CO2. 
Of course, there are many other applications, but Qualaby presents a collaborative focused solution that encourages people to interact with each other. We process this information and give the real-time insights, making your travel assistant more accurate than any other solution. Our information was born from real problems. Our users can report the insecurity level, street work, a change in a bus stop location, and much more, generating more than 10,000 reports every month. The mobility industry is growing fast, and it is mainly driven by electromobility, automotive industry, and BTC and will reach new opportunities of $1.8 trillion by 2030. We can access a business of $150 billion in Latin America, where more than 300 million people suffer from an inefficient mobility network. We have explored different models, but we began monetizing in 2021 by offering transit data and mobility analytics as the main revenue stream. Now we are also working with with, the, with the partners by offering three planning APIs and co-branded applications with a monthly license. We are also launching a new product for private companies to promote sustainable transportation for their employees, measuring their carbon footprint. We have built strong relationships with big partners, having us client companies like Google, Renault, Intel, or Google, for instance, generating revenue, but also accelerating our go-to-market strategy. The idea began in 2012 with lots of failures, but a lot of learning also. We launched our first mobility startup in 2015, but Wallaby was born in 2019 to become the main mobility solution of emerging markets. We have opened a seed round looking for $2 million to accelerate our business in Chile and Mexico, having little ventures inside of this round already. Of course, I have an excellent team working by my side. My partners, Alexis, in charge of day-to-day -day operations, Joaquin in the CEO chair, and Jose helping us with the financials. Outstanding professionals have also joined us, convinced that mobility is key to build sustainable and inclusive cities. At last, I invited you all to join our trip and build better and inclusive and sustainable cities together. Thank you very much. Hello. I'm Leonardo Gutierrez, I'm representing Trufi Association, an international NGO that digitizes public transport. We are focusing in public transport that is informal as it exists in Latin America, and Africa, and East Asia. We have created a journey planner app that, and are developing a data platform and a driver app. Actually, we are a non-profit startup for informal public transport uh, our first app was launched in 2018, and we are founded uh, like an NGO in 2019. Our mission is improve public transport worldwide through digitalization, and our vision is that people in developed countries uh, choose public transport options over other options because they are uh, accurate, uh, helpful, and attractive. Our flagship product is a multimodal journey planner that is open source and cross and cross platform. We are focused on informal transport. And uh, what is informal transport? What is our definition? Informal for us is no official stops, no schedule, no documentation of, of bus lines, and no official transport network, but a private agencies. We define semi-formal like a mixture of formal and informal transit like metro in Addis Ababa. That metro is entirely formal and uh, mini buses are entirely informal and work together. Or uh, we have another case in Bolivia, in, in La Paz, we have gondolas that are formal and mini buses in, in, and trophies that, uh, that feed the, the gondola systems. Uh, it's typical in Latin America and Africa and Asia, and uh, probably most of the population of the of the world actually move in informal transport systems. Uh, we can also use uh, our journey planner in, in, in a formal transport, in time formal, and we can also uh, work it with other modes of transportation. For example, we can uh, create a specific journey planner that combines bikes and public transport. 
formal or informal. We have apps uh, right now in Cochabamba, in Bolivia, in Accra, in Ghana, in Addis Ababa, in Ethiopia, in Tetuan, in Morocco. Uh, they have local games like uh, Trophy App, Throttle App, Geneguso, or Corsa App, or Boost Boy. Uh, we have also apps in, in, in Germany, our technology is used also in Germany. We have a project in Herrenberg that combines all, uh, all the modes of transportation of this city. And we have now an app in Hamburg that works uh, together with bikes and public transport systems. The cyclists can use the metro, the train, the um, ferries, even the ferries, uh, but they have an information this moment about the, the the blocks times and the lines that allows bikes, and we put the information of the bikes in an app uh, or, or the public transport. In our main product is um, is our Trophy app. It's an open source multimodal journey planner for semi-formal public transport in big cities. It's not only an app. It's a um, it's a kind of, of Lego of an app. It's um, have models, open source models, that can be the base for other apps. Uh, but specifically, the Trophy app that runs in Cochabamba is an app that runs in Flutter, uh, that uses OpenStreetMap, map, map Tyler. Um, also have the, the, the advantage that make that create full door-to-door -door navigation includes all the modes of transportation. If you need to walk uh, or bike or take and commute in, in a bus system, uh, we, can, uh, we can calculate this planification. Uh, it's re it was released as open source under an AGPL uh, license. Um, our our other, other important feature is that this app is uh, wide label, uh, a city and authorities or a citizens of a, of a region can create their own app and put your brand or logos and create a, a very, very customized uh, app using this technology. This app is also the first open source journey planner worldwide in Apple Store. Um, our method to create information to put in the app is uh, from community building. We work with uh, communities around the world. Uh, we build and support OpenStreetMap communities and train them to map roads, both roads or any transportation modes. Uh, we are specifically trained to create this kind of information in OpenStreetMap. Then we, we check all the quality of this data uh, and make the, these routes uh, publicly available on the street map for, uh, for free and for everyone. Um, using this information, we create, uh, we, we calculate using our app and find the best multimodal door to door journeys. And um, the information of using the app, the planner, can help the cities to create better transport links. Uh, between using the journey planners from our user data. All the information that we create crowdsourcing. And we believe that the crowdsourcing is a plan A in our, uh, in our organization, crowdsourcing is a plan A. It's not a backup solution. Uh, should not be con considered a, a backup solution. Uh, when, when professionally generated data is not feasible or affordable. Um, the, the data generated from users and volunteer generated data, uh, when it is open data, enables innovation and it, it is used by some of the most dynamic and successful companies in this moment. Many transport sectors, companies use OpenStreetMap in this moment, as well as commercial sites like Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, uh, social sites like Facebook, uh, Foursquare, Pinterest, Snapchat, your other software and service companies such as Digital Globe and Grammy, and many government, governments, humanitarian sectors, 
and uh, news and media organization use data created crowdsourcing. This is the way that we create this, this data. Uh, we, in the first place, collect and digitize the data, connecting with the local communities. Then we create an, an standard GTFS files using this information from the communities and open a strip map. And we use this information, GTFS, to make door-to-door -door road planning using Open Trip Planner server. And then uh, we put this information in, in, an, in our apps or in a web service also. One of the, of the challenges, or the biggest challenge, is uh, up, keep, man, keep up updated the data from those roads. In the case of Cochabamba, we have a lot of bus routes, almost 700 routes, and the, these routes are, are operated by unions of transportees in, instead of the city government. And uh, frequently, the government uh, frequently the routes have uh, have changed, and is not informed this change to the to the city government, and it's too hard uh, maintain updated all the data in the city. We created recently a feature to uh, maintain the uh, uh, bus routes, and the user of the app can uh, track the app and refer the bus route and uh, we can collect this data and use this data to, to keep uh, updated the data of the, the, the public transport systems uh, in Cochabamba. The Trophy project is maintained by us, by our, our organization, and recently uh, we reached 2,000 2, users, almost 2,000 users. We have also other projects uh, this is a nuptial project is uh, in Mauritania. We work together with the World Bank to create from scratch the public transport information from the city uh, and create and, and the GTFS standard uh, files. We work uh, directly with the OpenStreetMap community in the city. We trace 59 routes in this moment uh, and create all the GTFS files of the, of the city. These, these files can help to run in the future uh, our app or other apps or uh, run the simulations of the city public transport. Uh, we can work in places where other companies or projects can't because uh, obtaining data is too hard uh, in these cities like Mauritania. We create this information uh, entirely remotely. We connect with the local community and this project was uh, created, uh, this data was created in the, in the pandemic, in the middle of the pandemic, and happily we can uh, obtain this data and, and create the DFS files uh, totally. Thank you. Thank you for, for your attention. So thank you. We have just heard from uh, Leonardo and uh, shown his video. He is also with us on Ion Zoom if we have questions for him, but we will be able to uh, also take questions afterwards. I think now it's time for Thomas to present us the crowdsourcing work at MoveIt. All right, guys. Um, let's talk a bit what we're doing. So I already present myself this morning. My name is Thomas. to whoever missed it. Um, I've been the head of the data operations in MoveIt for four years. Now, I want to start with just to remind ourselves the scale and a bit of story before I go into the examples of the crowdsourced data that we do have. So back at 2012, um, whoever founded Movie, the founders, uh, started Israel. Um, only Israel was in the app. And very, very soon, we wanted to progress. So we launched Barcelona. And then we started to get a lot, a lot, because once you open uh, anything uh, in the App Store on a country level, it's open to the whole country. So everybody that are not based in Barcelona opened Move It, and nothing was available, right? And they complained. We kept getting so much complaints, 
And then we understood it takes us so much time and so many, the pipeline was enormous of the request and we understood one simple thing, it's not scalable. We cannot grow to those numbers in the amount of time we want by ourselves. It's just not doable. So we roll back the ball to the side of the users. And we told them, you know what? We want to provide service in your cities, but help us. And then it actually worked. We, I can say it's a decade after, but um, so let me tell you a bit about where we stand today. Different main when channels. We're talking about crowdsourcing, crowdsourcing uh, the data. So uh, we have three. The first I will speak the main uh, about is our community and two more from the users. Uh, so let's get started. The Movitors community, I touched it shortly, briefly uh, this morning. Very, very high motivated volunteers. We greatly appreciate the work every day. We will talk more about them, of course. Um, thanks to them, there's hundreds of millions of people that can commute um, every day um, on the best tree planning that they can have all over the world. So we're talking about many people from all over the world. I have to say there are great stories behind the community. The people with amazing background, people from Argentina mapping in Japan, for example, things that we wouldn't even imagine. And those are the faces or some of the faces that um, we talked every day with. what they actually do, right? So we'll get to the mapping part, which is a very heavy thing, of course, the, the, com the community are handling, but it's not only that. They are actually communicating to the agencies. They are like movie representatives on every place on the ground. They provide immediate changes. We'll see it in a second. They do on ground testing, they go out. They actually live it, they see it, they map it live. And also localization is a very, very big differentiator, of course, how the Move It app should reflect, even in the UI in London is completely different in Chile, or of course in China. And they really, really support us with understanding that as well. So once we build the community, it's, you know, it's the big challenge is not only to have it, but it's also to motivate, engage, keep it live uh, as it should. So we have, of course, many programs. Uh, we will see a few other examples. Um, if it's with universities, mapathons to go out, actually. Sorry, it's not the go out. The go out is a city expert where the, the uh, community actually go out. We'll see the pictures, and then they do mapathons of mapping it. And of course, eventually, of course, we have all the moderation aspect of it, but the ambassadors are the highest ranks and they are the community leaders of the region. Here you can see um, the left one is from Malaysia and the right from Brazil, just riding together, uh, mapping the missing information, a new bus line, a new metro line and so on. Um, the university programs, which are huge success, uh, we start with the, those classes where they grow to be a very essential part of our community. People with that passion. Uh, Mapathons, this is how it looks. We arrange it. Uh, we have operation manager that is in charge of every region, is in charge of the uh, community as well, um, talking to them every day. Now, also the big, big part of it is actually a place that they all actually communicate, work together, because you want someone that work on something to reflect it to their friends and their community and also to be able to share and, and maybe they will find a different conclusion. So we have this web platform of the Transit Data Manager, the Our Editor, uh, which is open. Everybody can register and use it. Um, and start being part of the community. It's open to everybody. So, and an example, we uh, had a sudden change, right? This is one of the difficulties. 
is not only getting the GTFS and knowing, okay, I have a route that operates in those hours, those uh, stop sequence and so on, is what happening right now. Now, the GTFS time to generate from the changes that are being made or decided or maybe a force of something uh, external um, until it generates, it's irrelevant if it happens today or even tomorrow in some places or five days even. So what do you do? Every community member can go and map the change immediately and implement it worldwide. This is just an example of a temporary change. We call it short-term change, it just TCs. They can go and cancel and bypass five clicks. You see it on a map and you change it, okay? Now, depends on who you are is the moderation process, of course. Another very important thing is that Four years ago, we struggled with fares. We wanted to show the fare calculation for the whole tree planning. It's more than just having a GTFS fares V1, which has around 600 agencies nowadays have it. Um, and I'm not talking even about V2, which approximately 60 agencies has it. With the community, and you can see here, they can really add the rules, the first, the zone, everything, and you know which is coming from, if it's from community or not, so they can add to the official data and they can modify the official data and, of course, generate anything from scratch and generate fair rules that are really into um, and as reality. According to this, we have more than 2,000 agencies with the fair rules, um, so that's, this is another great thing. Give the ability to the people with the motivation. Now, this is a, the community aspect. A, on a different channel, we have the users, right? So you only need a fraction of it. When you have a big amount of user base, you need a fraction of people that will be engaged and will collaborate with you. First thing that we started doing is been obsessed with the feedback since, and those examples are not the five stars examples. This is not, uh, and, and I have to tell you, to be honest, I, I removed the horrible things that they said about Move It, but they gave us great information. They gave us exactly the reason why we want to be obsessed. We want them to change their one star review to five. How we do that? We take, and I marked in, everybody can read in their own language. This is just an example of those people, those users cared. They cared enough to write it to us. So we cared enough to take it and implement it. And we managed to change the review or to change their experience. In other words, with the tools that we have, we managed to improve the data. So this is one chain. The second is, the app application, the, the, the features we actually implemented in the app. So I will show some of it, but just for you to understand the concept, any user can easily go, as you can see, to any stop and modify it, okay? Add exactly the name, really, really simple, the location, add a picture, any comment, very easily, okay? Any one of you can do it right now. Then, of course, we can report so many other informations on this is an elevator that is out of service, for example. It can be a bus driver or a bus that didn't stop at the, st at the station. Maybe the, the bus is dirty. Maybe there's an incident. Anything is, a, everybody are able to report instantly. Now, this is um, something that Corona, of course, a, gave a very high impact, and this is to mark the crowdedness. Now, once a user marked crowdedness, it can be on a stop or a line level, um, we show it, okay? Uh, of course, everybody can review it and see it. This is just an example. But once you mark it, you're not only seeing all the reports, you can mark if it's relevant or not and you can see the freshness of it, which is super critical. This is one minute ago, I just did it right in the example, but you can see if maybe it's 15 minutes ago, maybe it's not relevant. So this is very important. Of course, we have a threshold that we will not show it. 
But the interesting part of just one example about the crowdedness is that if we have it live, we will show you standing only, for example, this is what I marked back at the example of line 160, because it happened a few minutes ago. We know it's relevant. But if it's already f two more minutes, then line 85, I don't have this example. They don't have this information right now live from anyone. I will not show it. I will do a retroactive uh, data statistics and will show you it usually has in this trip, in this stop, in this time, in this day. That's usually what's happened. So we use that data of the crowdsource not only for live information, of course, but to anticipate the unknown. And eventually, everything that the users are reporting and the community, of course, entering, being channeled into our one platform. And you can see here an example of report, how we moderate, how we handle it. The community member gets the alert that anonymous user report, listen, you have bad data, or I want to change this uh, line, or even any comment. And they all together as community debate about it, and the person that resolves this, it's be, been recognized. And of course, the moderation here is very powerful since nobody in the community really wants to be the wrong one that another uh, high-ranked community member needs to correct. So they're making sure of things in a very thorough way, um, and this is how it works. So everything is connected. Bottom line, I mentioned at the beginning that we could have not done it on ourselves alone. We needed the help of the users of the community. Today, 78% of our data has been managed by community. This is, again, otherwise we wouldn't have been uh, having this. Um, so greatly appreciated, and uh, thanks to our community and users. Thank you, guys. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie Monroe. I'm with Transit, the app, based here in Montreal. So welcome to Montreal, everyone, if you haven't been here before. Um, it was really great to learn more. This, this panel was my idea, actually, because I feel like we're doing a lot more with crowdsourced data, and I know that a lot of other folks are. And so I mostly come to this space with a lot of curiosity about what everyone else is doing, but I'm excited to also share a little bit about what we're doing. Um, and I also just wanted to say thank you so much to Mobility Data for bringing this together. It's been so interesting. I'm really excited for tomorrow, too, and uh, really appreciate uh, and, and happy that um, it can happen in Montreal. So if you're not familiar with Transit, we're, um, like MoveIt, a multimodal trip planning and payment um, app based here in Montreal, available in 300 cities around the world. And we really um, pride ourselves on our partnerships with transit agencies in particular. So we have really close partnerships with um, transit agencies, many of whom sort of endorse us as their official app. And I think that um, I say that at the, at the beginning um, because I think that informs our approach a bit to crowdsourcing of data as well. We really see ourselves as not just, you know, um, something that users rely on, but also a close partner to the transit agencies and their efforts to provide public transportation um, to uh, folks every day. Um, so that is us. Um, if you're familiar with the app, so raise your hand if you have ever used transit before, just so I have a sense. Okay. So we've got some familiar folks who are familiar in the room. But if you haven't, um, one of the most core features, and when you, you talk about crowdsourcing data in our app, um, one of the things that we've done since basically the beginning is um, there's a, a go mode that's sort of like step-by-step, -step, directions in your ear, it tells you when to get off the bus. Um, we find that our... Um, our users who are blind and low vision particularly appreciate it, but also, um, you know, I just, I'm always a space cadet on the bus and I will not remember to make my transfer unless someone tells me to, if I get a push notification. Um, so uh, what this feature does is not only, um, you know, help users get where they need to go, but it also um, generates uh, vehicle location data from the user. So obviously we ingest GTFS and GTFS real time whenever it's available. Um, but in addition to that, um, we ask users to, to opt in to anonymously share their location while they're using the app on the bus or train. Um, and then that gets shared with other folks. So I took this screenshot um, yesterday in Montreal. Um, the smiley face on the bus line there means that someone on that bus is using transit and sharing their location with Go. Um, and this is totally opt-in. You can use the app without doing this, and we don't know anything else about you, so it's anonymous. It's just sharing your location, and all it takes is one person on the bus for everyone else to have 
super, super accurate real-time um, location of that bus. Um, we also have it a bit um, gamified, so you get Go points. You can see how many other people who are using the app in, in your area um, saw that vehicle location to really be able to tell how many people you helped get more accurate real-time um, vehicle locations. So uh, that gamification aspect, some people get really into that. Um, as you can imagine, this fill, fills gaps where um, real-time data isn't available. I um, just moved actually from Montreal to Philadelphia, and I was using the bus a lot in the past week and since I moved there a week ago in Philly, and there's sometimes there's good real-time data and sometimes there's not. And, uh, but uh, you can see if there's a transit user um, on the bus, you can, you can still have that real-time. Um, so uh, a lot of people use this. This is something we've been doing for a long time. This is sort of like you know a core to how our app works and core to, I think, what makes it um, so valuable valuable to so many folks is, is this uh, feature of crowdsourcing. But I also want to talk about um, some stuff that we've been doing over the course of the past couple of years that is a bit newer for us. Um, uh, as we heard from Move It uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was a big rush to try to understand how to get um, more information about crowding um, into the app. This is something that um, a few folks were talking about before. I remember the transit agency in Pittsburgh had already been doing it a little bit pre-pandemic, so they were really ahead of the curve. Um, maybe some other folks too. Uh, but uh, you know, in addition to working really closely with um, transit agencies to try to turn their, um, you know, automated passenger counter data into real-time um, data, you know, make sure the spec uh, for GTFS could support um, real-time crowding information. Um, we also launched um, questions in the app about how crowded the bus is um, as part of our sort of holistic effort here. We got real-time data from the agencies. We, um, for, for, for agencies that could not share real-time data for various technical reasons or whatever, um, if they had historical data, we have t we've taken the historical data and can make um, predictions in the app based on that. Also, predictive is nice for, you know, you know how crowded a bus is right now on the other side of town, but you, that doesn't necessarily tell you how crowded it's gonna be when it gets to you, so that also adds value there. But in addition to that, um, we did launch um, this question, and this question only shows up if you're, if you're riding the bus or the train, if you're in go mode. So it's a subset of our total user base that would see um, this question, but we know that the answers are coming from people who are actually on the bus at that moment. Um, and what we found was really amazing, which is that we were getting like greater than 50% response rates to this question from people. And when you talk about intercept surveys and asking people questions and trying to get them to answer questions, like that is a pretty incredible response rate um, of the Go users. More than half of them were, were answering the question. Um, so that made us think, what other kinds of questions can we be asking in the context of um, uh, a go trip, someone that we know is actually riding the bus, waiting for the bus, on the bus, um, getting off the bus. And so we just launched this um, last month, actually, um, a program called Rate My Ride. This is sort of V1 of it. There's going to be more uh, questions and more um, aspects to it. But um, we launched five questions. One um, is asked uh, when the user is waiting at the stop. Um, and that is, is this stop accessible? Do you think the stop is wheelchair accessible? It looks accessible. It's not accessible. Not sure. So that data is coming in. Um, we're still sort of evaluating it. We obviously want to get that data back out as quickly as possible, but that's like a little bit more objective compared to some of these other questions. So we're doing some data validation, working with agencies, making sure that that's, um, that's accurate information. But that's certainly a place where we find agencies have gaps in the data that they're able to provide and what they know about their own, um, their own infrastructure um, and something that users uh, can really benefit from. Um, in addition to some of the other accessibility stuff we've already done, this was a gap that we, we wanted to fill. Um, uh, is the vehicle crowded? So continuing with that crowding question that sort of um, you know, made us realize that we should ask more of these questions. Um, are people wearing masks? So we actually launched this right before um, the many transit agencies in the US dropped the mask mandates, not all of them, but many of them, um, like the week before. So we were able to kind of watch that in real time. So there's a, um, a blog post um, and some stuff that we've published that shows sort of some open data, real time information about, um, you know, rider-generated information about how many people are wearing masks on various transit agencies' uh, vehicles all over the country. Um, did the vehicle come on time? Uh, and then an overall rating for how people um, 
uh, experience the ride at the end of the trip. We've gotten um, to the accessibility one, gets, has gotten a little bit fewer responses because we don't ask it every single time people go to the same stop. <laughs> um, but the other ones, we're getting um, about a million and a half uh, responses per question since we, since we launched. So it's been, um, you know, in keeping with the really high response rates that we saw for the crowding question, people are really willing to do this. It takes one second, you're on the bus already, you're already in go mode, you just tap it and then it goes away. It's not uh, a big imposition and it's people who are already on the bus thinking about the bus, et cetera. One thing we really wanna make sure of um, uh, is that we're sharing this information back out to the riders. I think that that helps um, riders understand why it's important um, to, to share this information is that they can see that it's useful to them to, to be able to see it as well. So these are some of the ways um, in the app and you can play with the app now. This, is, this really just came out recently. So um, you can see some of the ways that on a particular line, um, you can see uh, like how we're serving that information, that crowdsource information back out um, to the user. But in addition, and kind of going back to our agency partnerships model, um, we really want to work with transit agencies to be able to ask the questions that they want to ask um, in the app. So this is, you know, if V1 was, oh, oh crap, we got to figure out the crowding question. V2, a little more organized, let's ask a set of questions, let's see how the responses come in, let's work with transit agencies to share that data with them. Um, I would say like the next iteration is let's work with our partner transit agencies specifically to, to ask the questions that they want to ask of the specific riders on the specific lines on the specific times that they want to ask them. Um, so this is sort of like coming soon and would be, we're, we're very much excited to talk to our, all of our transit agency partners about um, the types of questions that they think would be most useful. Um, and there's lots of complicated questions like do you ask about whether the bus driver was good or not? What kind of politics of that? You know, it's, it's a very fascinating set of questions that comes up here. But, um, but uh, I think core to our model is sort of being that bridge between um, riders and transit agencies specifically. And that um, I think really informs our approach to um, uh, crowdsourcing in general. And then just kind of taking a step back, this is kind of like stepping back in time a little bit. If the, if the rate my ride stuff that I just showed you is like a super quick intercept survey, one question built into the experience of using the app, we also do kind of more old fashioned survey work um, a ton in the app as well. And this is also both um, on our own, we do like a quarterly um, rider happiness benchmarking uh, survey across globally um, everywhere that we are to try to get information about um, yeah, rider perceptions, uh, demographics, kinds of things that we wouldn't know otherwise just based on like user behavior in the app. Um, and then uh, we work closely with our transit agency partners to, on a committee to sort of shape what those questions are, but try to keep them consistent over a quarterly basis so we can see, um, especially you know, during, over the course of COVID recovery and all, you know, transit agencies have a lot of questions about um, their riders and how they're doing and what they're thinking these days. So we're really trying to help um, answer those questions in a way that benchmarks agencies across their peers so they have a good idea of how they're doing. Um, we uh, had over 27,000 responses in North America to the one that just closed out um, this past month. Um, we post uh, periodically sort of top line national results um, on our website and we're gonna do a webinar later this month. You can come to a webinar um, to learn more about you know, what we've seen and this has been going for at least like six rounds now. So I think we have, uh, we're starting to see changes over time and trajectories. Um, through COVID and stuff like that. So some of it is more qualitative. It it's definitely takes a little bit more time than just like pushing one button in the app, but we also do um, surveys in this way. And finally, you know, those are surveys that we generate, but we also um, post surveys in the app that our transit agency partners are doing um, for the types of planning work that they're doing all the time. Um, I will like always come back to a Philadelphia example, but in Philadelphia, they're doing a big bus network redesign right now called Bus Revolution. Um, and they uh, worked, you know, they have various uh, consultants and folks helping them um, with that project. Um, but we are one of the one of the partners that is helping with it. And we have tons of riders in Philadelphia. And so if you want people to come to a community meeting about your bus network redesign, putting a, a banner up in the app that all the bus riders are looking at is a really good way to do that. And so we've um, been able to um, help our agency partners um, and even agencies that aren't necessarily super formal partners of us, but they, they recognize that we're one channel for their survey work and one uh, place that a lot of their riders are looking to. Um, 
have found that it's useful to work with us, especially to reach um, some hard to reach groups. W WMATA in DC worked with us specifically on um, some of their, their outreach to Spanish speaking writers because we can put up a banner in the app just to folks who are using the app in Spanish, you know, something like that. Um, so I think this is, you know, less of the like uh, initial, I think when we were thinking about crowdsource mobility data, we we're more thinking about like the stuff that would end up in the GTFS and just GTFS feed or something um, and, and the kind of the stuff that MoveIt does um, so well. Um, but I think there's also sort of the broader question of just like how do we use apps which are the places that people are looking for this information as a channel for not just getting the data to um, to riders from transit agencies, but also getting information and perception and like just lots of other information that transit agencies can use back to the transit agencies as well. So I will leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Please have a seat. Tell me if you'd like to join us. I don't know if the room has questions. Oh, yes. Oh, we have two questions. I was curious, you know, it seems like crowdsourcing is a way in some way to correct for something that's been coming up a lot today, which is data quality from transit agencies. I work for a transit agency. I know our data often has quality issues. It's true. Um, but I was really interested in, so I think, the transit app perspective of sort of building that partnership with agencies. And I'm curious, has engaging them with some of these things like you know, support with surveys, for example, has that kind of, I'll put it bluntly, has that helped them pay more attention to some of the quality issues that maybe led to the crowdsourcing in the first place? That is a great question. I'm trying to think of like a specific example. I would say, broadly speaking, I think that crowdsourcing can fill gaps in, in data and correct for some data quality. I think that, I'll, you know, a lot of transit agencies really do care and pay a lot of attention to this data, but um, but you can't be have all eyes everywhere all at once. And so I think it's, it's less of like, oh, they weren't paying attention to it, and now we're able to get them to pay attention to it more. I'm not sure we, we necessarily really have that power, but it's more like there are just limitations, and there's limitations on, you know, you know very well, there's limitations on what transit agencies can do. So we just try to be um, a support and a way to, to try to, um, you know, get more information to them than that they didn't have before. I mean, yeah, I would love to give ourselves the credit of like, wow, we've shined a light on this thing, but I don't think that's necessarily really what's happening. I think there are really amazing people who are trying really hard and there's just limitations on what they can do. And um, there's, there's also types of data that transit agencies can provide and types of data that transit agencies can't. And I think the Rate My Ride stuff is interesting because some of those questions are really, even did it come on time is like, depends what your perception is of on time and having a sense of, um, you know, having the pulse of what the riders are thinking is, is uh, really valuable information for everybody to know and not necessarily um, exactly a, an objective um, question. So there's some stuff that like by definition the transit agencies can't offer and some of, the, some of it is more like uh, what they don't have the resources to, to know. I don't know if that really answered the question but it's kind of how we think about it I think. Anthony from Google Maps. Um, uh, I just want to build on on Logan's question. I was wondering, for for this issue around uh, like when there's a some kind of core data problem that that users you know basically fix in your apps, um, what is the response typically or that that you get if you send that back to the transit agencies? Because we do um, on the Google Maps side, we're with our transit partners program sending all kinds of requests to transit agencies and we see a myriad of responses if we get a response at all. And I'm just wondering, do you, like, do you, have, a, do you have a policy where every change goes back to them um, at some point or do you, like, how do you pick and choose what you just fix versus what you try to get them to fix? So there isn't one answer to your question. Um, it really depends on the agency and the relationship we have. At the moment, what we actually do is that each uh, of source we get it gets updated, we immediately fetching, and then we run the validation. It really depends what comes out of it and our relationship. In most cases, we're trying to handle it ourselves due to two reasons. One, even if we have great relationship, right, we will notify, but we still fix it on ourselves because the time uh, that takes the agency to fix data, we need it now, we need it yesterday, right? Many agencies, and I plan to talk about it also tomorrow, many agencies 
plan their GTFSs, you know that probably as well. I, I know the platform you're offering, which is great. The agency just need to use it. But they, they are aiming to do a GTFS switch on the same date. No, no buffer for anything, right? So once you get, a, I will call it stuck with the unvalid or issues with the GTFS, you don't have the buffer even for communication on that on the time. So we will, the, the agencies we do have partner, you know, great relations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we will notify any anyway, even if we fixed it. There are some cases that we're not sure what to do. In the more complex parameters of the GTFS, there could be several solutions. So either we will not show it until they will give a fix or we will ask our community or anything, or of course we will approach the agency for sure, every time. Since we have something we do not sure what is, if we're not sure 100%, we will of course check it. So we have a lot of cases like this and there's agencies that it's a matter of one hour until they, they answer us and there are agencies that after a week pops and, and the answer to us after we will already let them know what needs to be fixed. Or we send them the files, we send them everything and the reports. Um, so there's any kinds of, of, of types of this. I want to answer and, and again say thanks to Tuto to, for this invitation. I'm in Colombia now and I'm happy to be here uh, remotely. Sadly, I want to, to stay in, in Montreal today. Um, I want to, to share uh, something from Trophy. Uh, about the question. We, we work uh, the crowdsourced uh, data from the side of the generating of GTF, the ba very basic uh, side of the equation. And we uh, depend on the communities and crowdsourcing every time to, to generate this data. If you work uh, in some places without any relation with the agencies, for example, in, in Cochabamba, the, all the public transport is informal and was uh, and is managed by the informal uh, union of, of transporters. And even the city doesn't know or didn't know the, the, the roads. They have almost 70 hundred roads in this moment. And keep it up the updated is, is very is very hard. We have some tools to obtain information all the time from the users to maintain this data. Uh, because the, the informal public transport uh, really wants everyday works to maintain the basic, the very basic GTFS data, the very static. Um, we tried uh, and we worked uh, all the time. We are looking for uh, solutions to maintain this data updated, even without any help of, the, of some city authorities. Uh, I want to share that with the, with the, with the people that, that answered. Thank you. Yeah, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because it is so different than, you know, our, we're, our work is so focused on our agency partnerships that a lot of, you know, where we have a bunch of agencies where we have like a shared Slack channel and we're in direct contact with their data folks. And that's, uh, you know, it doesn't always work that way. Um, and certainly there are situations where we just, you know, fix it and, and let them know um, and hope that they fix whatever it is. But we also like, you know, because we have those partnerships have the benefit of trying to get, you know, a not just uh, you know them to fix it in the GTFS, but also a definitive answer if there's some question about the accuracy of the user-generated you know suggestion that's come in as well. We'd always rather know for sure from the agency what's going on, in addition to just like having them fix it for the future. Um, so, but there's a lot of different contexts and a lot of different places, and uh, it's cool to hear what you all are doing. Well, I'll try to speak well, but um, I'm Lisa, I'm from Google Maps as well. I'm um, curious on the user feedback front. Um, there's often a perception that when you're asking consumers for some things in the app that you're too annoying or you're asking too many times. So do you guys have a mental model on how you think about what is too annoying for a customer and any stats or metrics on an average time a customer responds to some of your questions, whether that's per week or per month? This is a really good question that I don't think I have like numbers oriented answers to, but I think it's something that we're paying very close attention to as we're launching. I mean, I would say in the context of like banners, there's just a couple ways that we communicate with folks in the app. There's a banner at the top that pops up um, based on some sort of cohort, ge geographical or stuff you've done in the app before. We have no ads in the app, so there's never gonna be a pop-up that's just like an ad for something. And so I think we're, we're 
very careful to recognize that we've like built a lot of trust with our um, users and we don't want to abuse that trust by having a million pop-ups. But they do they can trust that whatever information is there is coming from either a transit agency or us, the app, telling them something important about the app or uh, one of the other mobility providers that we have in the app. There's, not, there's never going to be something that's not that. So I think we, we do a lot of juggling of making sure there's not too many banners happening at once. I, I personally can't share like a, a, a stat of exactly how we're thinking about that, but I know it's it's, um, it's top of mind and things get nixed sometimes if it's going to be too many banners. We also do push notifications, which we're even more sparing with because someone's not already in the app looking at it and they can definitely get annoyed by those. Um, but uh, they can be powerful when deployed carefully. Um, and then I think we're still learning about this sort of like asking a question in more the flow of the, the user experience. And I think, you know, there was just a conversation last week about like, um, giving people the option to turn off different types of notifications. Now that we, there's, we're, we're asking them things in different contexts, giving the user control over turning stuff off if they're not um, into it, while also recognizing that a lot of people are, it's trying to make it as unobtrusive as possible so that people don't get to that point that they're frustrated. But yeah, sorry, that's not a very specific answer to your question, but it's certainly something that we think about and I'm sure that you think about all the time as well. I don't know if you have something more concrete you wanna say. <laughs> I, I just want to say that um, we, we also do offer the users the ability to choose the hours where they will be notified by something we send. We also have restrictions of what to send, how much to send, meaning even if by accident somebody will send something in uh, low frequency, it won't travel to the user uh, since it's very sensitive. And um, I can only assure two things. First. Depends on the, the place, um, in, in regions of LATAM maybe they, they will accept and be more open to get notifications, but in other places less, so we do it by market. And also, if you do something too much, they will tell you, uh, that's for sure. So yeah, um, I remember those and we, we're of course always listening, yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, hi, uh, Larry B. Garib from uh, Fabrique de Mobilité Québec. Uh, I have one question about uh, what's the business model of uh, Transit and Move It? Yeah, I can go first. Um, so we work closely with transit agencies and have a lot of you know, part, you know, paid partnerships with transit agencies around various procurement processes they've gone through either for an app or for various integrations or for various data sharing or that type of survey work that I mentioned. So that's um, a portion of our um, revenue. And we also, um, in the past year or about a year ago, launched um, Royale, which is a premium um, version of the app. So all the core features, you can you can download the app for free. It's a free app to use, but there is sort of a, a higher tier version of the app that is available for users to um, pay for. And what's interesting about it is because we have these extremely close partnerships with so many transit agencies, um, it's basically like a bifurcated model for that, um, for Royale, this, this um, you know, premium tier of the app. Uh, in some markets, um, it's just launched for the users to pay for if they want to. Um, and in a lot of other markets, our transit agency partnerships have actually chosen to um, you know, pay for Royale on behalf of all of their users. So it's free to the user. And that's something that the transit agency has decided to subsidize for their user base. And they get some perks with that as an agency as well in terms of um, the users being able to like customize the logo on the home screen and um, sort of some like soft white labeling. We don't really white label our app at all, but um, some, some ways that the agency can help get their brand across even more to um, the, the user. So, um, it's basically Royale um, as the sort of user-facing uh, piece of it, but also uh, government-facing, depending on the, the market, and then various other contracts that we have with, um, with transit agencies and, yeah, mostly transit agencies, sometimes like cities or other public um, sector folks. But we don't do ads. We don't, have, we don't sell anybody's data, and none of that is part of our business model um, at all. Thank you. So I, I presented in the morning a slide that uh, shows our mass solutions. Um, we basically, due to the consumer app, are able to generate very powerful solutions on uh, the mobility as a service platforms. We uh, have APIs, data APIs, for the private sector, government sector, uh, businesses, any agency that, that needs it. We have reports. 
uh, of people movement. This is a very powerful tool since uh, each agency might might know where their riders uh, up on or drop off, but they don't know where they started and where they ended their trip, right? It's very important. Just an example, um, how Lime should structure their, their morning start of, of vehicles in every place where people commute to and need it. Maybe you need to add 100 vehicles, scooters somewhere, right? So this is one solution we also provide. We have uh, um, an on-demand solution, um, meaning a transit that is on-demand, you can take it curve to curve uh, on the fleet organization, planning, operational, everything, dispatchers uh, use it. Um, we also have real-time solutions, um, deviceless even, um, and eventually the white label and ticketing, which is something we also do in the Movit app, uh, but also offer the white label and, and ticketing. We recently also uh, launched a, a both a ability to have the application uh, ads free. We start the investigation in ads, still trying to see where it takes us, but um, the basically all, all the business is uh, on the mass. Yeah, we also do a lot of mobile ticketing and mobility as a service. That is, I should have said that, but that's a piece of what we do too, is that we sell tickets and passes for bike share and stuff in the app. And obviously there's a cut of that that comes to us, but it's not necessarily the biggest share of what we do. I think Leonardo wanted to share something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just about, about the business model. It's a really hard question for an NGO, huh? <laughs> but uh, I, I'm trying to, to respond. Uh, we, we work mainly with the international uh, organization that helps cities in, in developed countries. We are an, uh, an NGO. We are an NGO and focus on uh, on this, this, uh, these places. And our idea is connect cities, authorities, or, you, or operators with the with international cooperation, like uh, JZ or AFD or World Bank. We, we made uh, uh, projects together with this organization to to obtain funding for other places in the world. Uh, for the other hand, we also work with some cities that is not in the developed countries, it's in Germany. We have some customers uh, for in a specialized uh, integration with some cities uh, of Germany. Uh, this is the way that we we obtain funds to our, our mission. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you to Leonardo and Katie and Tomar and Tuto for this, this wonderful session. Uh, I'm Taylor from ITDP, an NGO focused on sustainability in the global south. And all of this data that we're all that you're all are gathering is so valuable, um, especially when it can be used for the purposes of planning and improving the transit networks in cities and really showing the contribution of transit to mobility in a city. Um, it can help cities plan better transit that can save millions of tons of carbon dioxide emissions, right? But this can often only be done if that data is open and not only within the app or not only within the transit agency, but released in such a way that other uh, advocates can, can use it. And so I'd love to hear from each of you what you are doing to, to release your data, um, of course, of high quality, and to sort of give back data that often has been generated crowdsourced as from volunteers, how are you giving that back as a public good to the rest of the world? Thank you. Great question, knew that we would get it. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, one project, this isn't necessarily as focused on the crowdsourcing piece of it, um, but one project that we did sort of early in the pandemic when we recognized a gap that we could sort of um, uniquely fill um, was uh, in, in early pandemic, there was a, obviously a huge drop in ridership. Different agencies had different drops in their ridership, et cetera. Um, and uh, we worked with the American Public Transit Association to put out a dashboard publicly with the ability to like download raw data, everything, not just like a fancy dashboard, but the actual raw data, a way for researchers to request it, um, to basically um, use APTA ridership data, which was more historical and not as uh, you know real time, uh, and our user numbers, which were obviously plummeting at the time, but plummeting proportionally in different ways in different places in ways that you know helped 
agencies benchmark and understand what was going on uh, moment to moment in a time where it really needed to be moment to moment data and not just when it came in, uh, you know, periodically for, to, to the official APTA data. Um, and that, that um, transit.app slash APTA, that page is still up. You can still see sort of percentage recovery since pre-March um, 2020 for lots and lots of transit agencies, anybody that we had the pre-COVID data for. Um, so we're always looking for um, certainly that ways where it makes sense for us to, to make our data public. I think that um, it's a tricky thing in, uh, you know, as a company that's trying to make sure that we can be sustainable as a company, um, some of this information is what makes people come to our app and, and use our, our app instead of another app. So, um, you know, it's it's not sustainable for, for us necessarily to make every everything public that comes in, um, but uh, where we can, um, and, and I think uh, we'll probably see more of that in the future. I'm excited about some conversations that are happening about opening up more um, data in the future, um, but uh, we, we certainly have a history and a precedent of, of trying to do cool open data projects where we can. Um, and you're, you're totally right that the, the data has a ton of value. Um, we do work closely with transit agencies in, in less like fully open ways all the time to share data with them for those planning purposes and lean on those partnerships that we have with the transit agencies themselves. But um, you're right that there is more potential there and I'm excited for us to continue to explore it. So um, it's connect to the what is the business model, right, that I've been asked before. So what we are actually proud of, that we share everything on the tree planning and data aspect to everybody on freely on any platform. Uh, this is on one aspect, right? You cannot have them both and have a business uh, nowadays. But uh, there are partners, uh, agencies that go to our solutions and they can register in the movie data transit uh, manager and map the data and, and they get it and they can do whatever they want with it. So we do have those as well, but they need to, of course, use our tools. Um, that's the, um, ev everybody that shares any data with us can see it in the tree planning, whatever they want. Yes, thank you. Uh, we, we are, uh, uh, we are in, in, in Trophy, we are all, all the stages of the creation of data and even the code for our app is completely open. I think that is the, the, the main different, differential factor of our, our project like NGO. We have uh, the, the code open uh, and published entirely in, in GitHub. And this, we have a Trophy core is, uh, is the name that we, we have. And any any anyone can run our app using this this code, and not only we can uh, using this code, uh, anyone can run the app, but using their own uh, branding and something. It's completely it's completely uh, it's completely white label our our solution. And uh, for the other hand, we we responded the the equation. All the data generated by, by the apps is completely owned by the locals. In, in the case of the city authorities or the community, all the data is managed and run by the, by, uh, for, for the same users or for the same community in the city. Uh, our model is, 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 is not a create a big app in one, in one place. Instead of that, the, the idea is uh, empower the local communities of government uh, to run the app by their own, and uh, all the data uh, for this reason is owned by them, the, the city of, of the community. Uh, hello, my name is Anthony. I'm from Innovative Vehicle Institute here in Quebec, uh, and we do a lot of machine learning, and we have a challenge for machine learning, which we need a lot of data, so for which um, crowdsourcing is a good solution. And another challenge is that we need the data to be good. So if there's an issue with the data, there's going to be an issue with the model and with the algorithm. So my question is, uh, when you use crowdsource data, so I think as Thomas said in his presentation, if the users can modify the information about a stop sign or something like that, uh, can you trust the user to give you good data? And I guess as a follow-up question, if you, you can trust the user, how can you validate the information that he gives? And if you cannot trust them, um, what can you do with this information or does this data has any value if you don't know if it's right or wrong? I'll go, let Tomer go first. Okay. Um, it's, it's critical to know uh, 
the quality and the you know the valid data uh, the data we gather we take every act uh, that been made by the user or by any community member according to we have a moderation we have levels and a very very clear process so basically when a user edits or a community member edits they have their reputation they have their history and they have of course another person that approves the the changes you can compare it in a sort of what Wikipedia is doing right. So this is the model of moderation we based uh, at, and um, it's working very, very well. We do it for many years, um, and and the things that are not patting the moderation, you you, you see, we we reject it, um, and those things are happening as well. Yeah, on our side, I think we're also very, very nervous about this question. And it, uh, it causes us to take maybe a bit more conservative of a, of a approach. Um, and so um, the beauty of like where I started in my presentation is like vehicle locations, crowdsourced through Go, pretty impossible. Like we're, we're doing it based on mode detection on people's phones. Like they can't really fake it. That's, uh, you know, that's real. Um, then some of those questions that I was talking about with Rate My Ride are like uh, perception questions more than like objective questions. So that's not necessarily something that's you're taking the pulse of what people are feeling. There's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. Um, but when we do wade into that question of like, are people wearing masks are, uh, which is sometimes kind of a perception question too. Is it a lot? Is it a a little, um, or is this bus stop accessible? Um, you know, I think that some of that data is best, you know, what, what we have the benefit of is like a lot of close transit agency partnerships. We don't have this like huge community of, of folks that is sort of a, a, a subset of our user base, the way that move it does necessarily to be able to have this, the, the trust levels um, built in with the hierarchies there. Um, but I think we, we I, I envision a world where like, we're generating some data about which bus stops users think are accessible or not. And that is a much lower lift for a transit agency to go out and validate than to do the whole thing from scratch. You know, like there's a, there's a world where it's not um, about like just crowdsourcing or just getting the tr information from the transit agency. It's about putting that together and the transit agencies can be our partners in validating some of that data. And of course it's also your know, basic stuff like did everybody say the same thing or did one person say something different than everyone else? You know, we're putting those checks in as well as we start to ask these questions in the app more. Um, to make sure that you know we're at least getting what everybody seemed to think as opposed to just one person um there's you know a big range of questions that require you know uh, really just one person to give you an answer and uh you know like the vehicle locations on the bus thing it only needs to be one person on the bus and questions that we would really only want to serve that information back out to the to the other users if we know a lot of people agreed about it so that's kind of part of it in the case of trophy yeah. We are in the in the other side of the of the data. We we work a lot in creating from scratch in some places, small cities or places that is not in the target or the big companies. And uh, but it's a big challenge how how we value value the, the data that the people put. And our our approach is using open street map communities mainly. We work together and we uh, and we use the 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 reputation of the users in OpenStreetMap, and we check very, very detailed when someone put a road or 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 a point of, int of interest, and we we do, if we work together with the entire community of OpenStreetMap. is is important that we uh, when we put data in of bus routes in or, or transit routes in the in the in the map, there is a lot of check-ins that the uh, OpenStreetMap made for us. To that all the data is is um, consistent uh, to create it. For example, if you try to put a, a, in 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 the opposite way of in in a in a, in a street, uh, open street map doesn't allow that. But these kind of things uh, we can do that. We can do and work all, always uh, together with the communities of of this uh, of, of open street map. Hi, Bailey with Agile Mile. Uh, question for Transit. You mentioned that you give back a lot of that survey data right to the users, like right after they fill out a survey, they can kind of see the responses, the breakdown, the histograms. Do you ever receive any pushback from transit agencies for showing that data since some of it could be 
perceived as subjective? Um, and if so, how do you reconcile that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, when there are like full blown surveys where people are answering a bunch of questions, that's more like of a traditional survey. That's that data is like we make it clear who's getting it. Like this, your transit agency is asking you these questions, or we're asking you these questions, and that's not necessarily like served back up in the UI of the app, like the you know. 15 question survey that they took, but these rate my ride questions, we're trying to, you know, gear the questions towards things that the riders are going to find valuable and want to see, you know, the answer to it. Um, and obviously some of those can be negative perceptions. Some of those are, are, are not great. I think that, you know, we've seen a range of responses from transit agencies, but overwhelmingly like transit agencies are so hungry for information about what their users are thinking, um, that it has been more so, way more so that, that trans agencies are interested to know and um, excited to see the information rather than that they're um, nervous about it, uh, you know. So I, it's a great question and one that we're gonna continue to see play out as we ask more of these questions. I think part of it is like um, working with the transit agencies to see what makes sense to ask and the things that might make sense to ask in one market. You know, Tomer was talking about all the localization of different like cultural approaches to push notifications and stuff, but also, yeah, different different agencies want different things, or we're gonna ask different things, you know, um, beyond sort of the basic questions that we're, we're putting up. I think as it continues to evolve, it's gonna evolve in partnership with what transit agencies actually want, and it's not gonna look the same in every market, and there's things that are gonna be a no-go in some markets and are gonna be something that an agency is really excited to see in another market, so that's, we're not trying to like steamroll through everybody with the same questions as a part of the answer, I think. Do we have any other questions in the room? Yes, sir. Hello, uh, Carlos with Clear Impact. And the question is for Katie. Um, Katie, you mentioned that um, you received 27,000 survey back uh, with um, demographics information. Um, just curious what type of demographics you ask and if that information is shared with your transit agency's partners and what are they doing with that data? Yeah, um, another good, uh, going back to the question of like the questions you can ask and can't ask in different places, certainly demographics have, uh, there's different rules and different expectations over what you ask in different places. So we ask different things or fewer things probably like in France versus in the US or something. Um, but I'm most familiar with the US and Canadian context. We, we try to ask the demographic questions sort of in line with the way census questions are so that it's consistent and people um, know. I, I don't know all of the weeds of it, but I know we, we ask, for example, about um, you know uh, accessibility needs and disability stuff in addition to sort of race, gender, um, income, sort of standard things that you would expect. Um, and we do share that information um, at, an, at an aggregate level about our users in general. That, that type of stuff is in that top line, those reports that we put out, the webinar that's going to be at the end of the month. Um, but I'll tell you that the, the punchline is that uh, the demographics of our users in North America very much reflect the demographics of bus riders in North America. And I think sometimes there's um, sort of a... Uh, misperception about who's using apps, um, but when the app is telling you when the bus is coming, and it's really, really important to know when the bus is coming because you're gonna lose your job if you don't make it to that bus that day, then you're gonna find the best, you know, you're gonna find whatever the best app is for you to, to make sure that you can get there. Um, and, and those are the folks who are overwhelmingly using our app. We saw that even more during COVID when ridership dropped, but it did not go away. That there are lots of folks who continued riding um, public transit throughout um, the pandemic and, you know, kept our society running um, and so we were proud to to serve them in that time and I think yeah what 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 you'll see in that report what you can see looking back on our past reports is that um, yeah disproportionately low income disproportionately people of color in the US and Canada are who is using um, our app consistently especially since that you know real-time bus information is one of the most valuable things about sort of the user interface of it I think thank you for the question because we have four minutes left, I actually had one question that I sent to all of our panelists, and I'm a little bit more interested, and this time I'm speaking as myself, a rider, a transit nerd somehow, is if everyone is using crowdsource power, us, the users, who are basically being the workers behind the scenes, helping you generate 78% of your data, what do we get back as users, aside from the fact that we know where the bus is and we don't 
we are not late for our job. We are not. We are able to all be here, catch a plane, be at a summit. But what do we get back aside from that? So I mentioned it earlier, but we are basically obsessed with our users. So any feedback that is being received um, to us, and we get thousands of feedbacks a day, is being answered in a matter of a day or two, seriously being follow up, moved to community and such things. So we take the users, no matter which channel they will uh, approach us very seriously, we pick up the phone and call them if needed, and it happens almost on a weekly basis. Um, the, the second thing is that we do provide the information and everything they shared with all of them back, right? On the same way, they, the same platform they, they gave it, they can consume it immediately and everybody else. But uh, I will take your question to and the, take it to the meaning of there are so many, many, many volunteers that put a lot of effort. They do it, by the way, it was a mystery to me when I joined Move It, how, how that can happen. And they're actually really, really, really engaged to help their loved ones, their family, their, their co-workers, for example, to have that solution. They're proud of it. So all the credit and we give it to them when a community member or user do anything, then their name, if they, of course, agree, their name is attached to their change in the app live, right? And uh, this is something that we will always give all the credit 100% uh, since it's theirs, right? And we will always show it. Yeah, very good question. I think um, some of the, obviously some of the like more traditional surveys in the app sometimes have incentives that go along with them. Like if you fill out this survey, you'll be entered to win a thing, but that's, you know, a much, it's a much bigger ask to sit and fill out a 15 minute survey than it is to, to tap the answer to one question. But you're right that in aggregate, those, those questions, if they are making up more and more of our data, um, are very significant. But I think what we've seen and, you know, the really high response rates, are, I think show that, especially if we, um, if users understand the value of getting that information back, they're not necessarily expecting another type of compensation. I think we, we've done a few, um, like, uh, Crowdsource projects, I didn't talk about um, one because it, that it, it's not as typical of how we do it, where we were um, engaging a more like um, super user subgroup of folks in targeted cities to try to um, fill in some gaps in station entrance information. Um, and for that, we were giving people, you know, uh, free free um, access to Royale, our premium mode. Like, you know, there's different things that we can do. There's, you know, I think for a while the uh, the the crowdsourced um, crowding information would also affect your go points with the gamification in the app. So there's there's some things that we can do, but I do think there's something to this. Like people are just really happy to be able to like participate and give back, especially when they get it immediately back themselves. And it's not just like going off into the ether. Like I gave this information and I don't know where it's going. You know, if you can see the results, then I think people find probably maybe more value in that than you know other types of compensation. Yeah, thank you for the for the question, Tutu. In, in, in our case, we have three different uh, categories for users, uh, for, for people that help us. One is the unconscious open street map contribu contributors, people that put the streets, the point of interest, a lot of information. We use this information that is created on, uh, for, the, for the open street map contributors, not for the, uh, not for the public transport system or, or for generating the GTFS files. Um, but we use this this data. The other kind of user that we have is uh, OpenStreetMap communities that directly work in the generation of data from or create the GTFS data. Uh, for example, in, in Mauritania, the community of OpenStreetMap Open works together with us to create the, the public uh, transport map uh, or all the public transport data from, from Nupchal in, in Mauritania. And, it, and the two group is the, is the users of our apps uh, we have now uh, some features that obtain feedback, even it raising from the users to keep the, our roads uh, uh, updated in, in our app. It's, it's a new feature in, the, in, in, the, in, in, our, in our app. Uh, we are testing now in Cochabamba to obtain information about the roads uh, from users directly, from users of the app. Thank you. 
Muchas gracias, Leonardo. Uh, thank you, Katie. Thank you, Tomer, for this very informative crowdsource uh, session oriented. And without uh, more anything to add, I would like to thank you for staying until the end of the session. And we will see you at 6.30 in the room where we had lunch for a good networking night. Thank you again.